Hi everyone and welcome, this is The Apostate Prophet. In the past I talked very much about all the reasons why I stopped believing in Islam, and why it is a terrible religion, why you shouldn't believe in it. But I rarely talk about how it happens that you lose faith in Islam, and how people in general lose faith in this religion. I think this is especially an important topic because uh, Muslim apologists and people who generally have a problem with apostates and critics of Islam make it look like we just left Islam for our personal pleasure. It is much more complicated and I would like to bring you closer to how it really is by just telling you about myself. My religiosity was kind of a rise and fall. I grew up in a religious family and I always had respect for the faith. I kind of followed things whenever I could. Eventually, it came to the point where I started being becoming very religious. I wanted to make sure that I learn as much as possible, that I know as much as possible about this faith that I now want to dedicate my life to. So I started reading the Quran, reading scholarly books every day, starting to pray every day. I was getting increasingly faithful. My prayers started increasing and getting longer. I was this guy who, even among my religious uh, crowd, my religious friends, was considered the most religious one, the one who takes everything very seriously. What people didn't notice at the time was that in my mind I was also constantly thinking about what I was believing in, what I was reading every day. I noticed that uh, most people, most of those who believe, don't actually think about what they believe. They don't even think, I cannot go outside of this. They just think, this is what needs to be done and this is what I'm doing. They never actually question what they believe in, whether that combines well with your ideas and with your worldview and with your uh, emotions or not. If all that is compatible with reality or not, I was not that way. Thinking about those things that I learn every day gave me the ability to actually weigh whether what I'm learning is right or wrong. And it was a huge struggle because I remember that I would uh, go through the streets fasting, hungering for Allah, and I would love doing what I'm doing. But at the same time, I, I would think I would think about questions that I had on my mind, like scientific questions in the Quran. And I would try to, to get rid of those thoughts, try to blend them out, try to think I'm not supposed to think about this very much, because in the end, I might never understand what the Quran or what Islam, what Allah tells me, but I have to acknowledge that the Quran is the truth because it comes from Allah. So no matter what I think, I cannot possibly conclude that there is something wrong with what I'm reading, that I might be right. The conclusion always had to be that what I am reading is right and that whatever I am thinking, if it contradicts with what I'm reading, is probably wrong. Imagine approaching anything else in this world with such a mindset. It was during military service that I learned that I have to force myself to, to do something, even if I really don't like it. And while I was told that I should not question what I am forced to do, I would start questioning whether what I am ordered and forced to do actually makes sense or not. If you think that way, your military service becomes very painful. You are supposed to be mindless. So something in me started a huge rebellion during the military and that rebellion also started uh, slowly working against my faith because I noticed that what I was supposed to do during military, which is to not question and to just do what's being said, because what's being said is right and you are wrong, was kind of in alignment with Islam, which also told me that I was just supposed to do what I'm told and that I can never question because what I'm told is right and what I think is probably wrong. Maybe it was a good coping mechanism to start thinking further about my faith because I couldn't really start a rebellion during the military. But I eventually started going through everything that I learned and I noticed that my desire to fulfill my prayers was getting weaker because when the questions in your, in your mind start bothering you and shaking your faith, then it becomes very hard to fulfill the duties that you have to fulfill for this faith. It wasn't that I didn't like praying and that I therefore wanted to leave Islam. It was that I was really dedicated to praying and to fulfilling my Islamic duties. But with the questions that would arise in my head that Muslim apologists, Islamic scholars simply cannot give proper answers to would shake my desire of fulfilling those duties, of fulfilling the five daily prayers. I would start questioning myself in the middle of the prayer. I am doing this, but... Is the force that is asking me to do this actually telling me the truth about everything? And I think there is one thing that is, uh, that is so strong 
that is so important in my process of losing faith in Islam that I always have it in my mind and I always want to give it as an advice to all those who question, to all those who are afraid of losing faith and of going to hell. And that is the thought, Allah gave me a brain, Allah created me, he made me able to question and he told me in the Quran to think. If I now think and question, how can I be blamed for that? Should I not, as a human, listen to my nature and listen to the Quran? Should I not follow this great advice and maybe think as much as possible and stop blocking myself, stop putting barriers into my brain, stop forcing myself to stop when I'm afraid of all the places that my mind can reach? Well, after adopting that way of thinking, everything basically just went downhill for my faith because once I started allowing myself to question and to, to think to the fullest, everything just slowly fell apart. At first, I questioned all the scholars that I'm listening to, and I concluded that it simply cannot be that it is the scholars who are holding my faith together and who are being an authority over my religiosity. Because the Quran speaks to me, it never actually tells me to listen to scholars or to follow a spiritual leader or anything at all. At first I stopped recognizing the legitimacy of sects, popular institutions, popular schools. Then I slowly went into deconstructing the accepted forms of Islam in my brain, the vast movements and schools of Islam that people live by. Then I started reading the Quran again and I noticed what I really feel about the Quran, how I really think about it, because for the first time I allowed myself to actually think what I think while reading the Quran without blocking thoughts, without feeling too much guilt. At this point, I still had not lost my faith, but I was just allowing myself to actually use my mind as the Quran tells me to. And doing that, I noticed that there are so many questions in the Quran that I cannot answer, that Muslim apologists cannot answer, and I really gave them a chance. I really gave all of them a chance. I looked for so many answers by Muslim apologists, by imams, by scholars, about very popular questions that I had regarding uh, Islam and the Quran. Many of those questions simply don't have answers, and no matter what people tell you, no matter what Muslim apologists tell to non-Muslims about the Quran and about questions, and no matter what Muslim apologists tell each other and tell their loyal Muslim crowds. There are so many issues in the Quran that Muslim apologists want to answer online, but that most of the Muslims simply feel uncomfortable about. And I was one of those uncomfortable Muslims. I eventually started comparing Muslims and the Islamic world to non-Muslims and the non-Muslim world, especially in terms of uh, intellect. If you honestly make a comparison between how the Islamic world compares to the Western world or East Asia, for example, in terms of uh, knowledge, in terms of wisdom and education, it is very hard to hold on to the, to the assertion that Muslims and Islam held a higher ground in terms of education and knowledge. Eventually, I started questioning Muhammad. And I really loved Muhammad because you are supposed to love Muhammad when you are part of that. But I started questioning how I can trust Muhammad, how I can trust a person who lived 1,400 years ago, how I can trust anything that he said when humans cannot even trust each other. We don't trust each other. We don't actually take anyone's word on face value. We want to reevaluate and we want to fact check everything. How can we possibly trust this guy who lived 1,400 years ago and made very extraordinary assertions without ever presenting any proof? I'm not talking about proof that you find in Islamic reports by Muslims, verified and published by Muslims 1,400, 1,300 years ago. I'm talking about actual sources, actual documents of proof. Nothing has ever been proven about anything that he or people like him asserted. So how can I possibly believe them? How can we not trust each other about payments and want to see documents about that, yet we trust some complete random stranger 1,400 years ago in the desert about his claims that he communicated with supernatural beings that we cannot see and that no one has seen and documented? How can we trust that he was morally wonderful and flawless when much of what we know about him is in clear conflict with our understanding of good and bad and good and disgusting? Eventually, the only place to look at was the Quran, because the Quran could be the only thing that could verify the authenticity of Muhammad, because the Quran is supposed to be the, uh, the absolute word of Allah 
word for word. And if, if the Quran cannot be trusted, then nothing can be trusted. Yet didn't I have questions about the Quran from the very beginning, even when I was at the peak of my religiosity, even when I was so much in love with Islam and with what I was believing in? Didn't I constantly keep myself from questioning and keep myself from, from accepting the answers that I know very well in my mind are reasonable answers that conflict Islam? Didn't I have to rely on explanations by third parties, by Muslim scholars, Muslim apologists, whose job it is to solidify the faith, to defend the faith, to prove that the Quran, that, that Islam is right. It is their sole objective to prove that Islam is the truth. It is not their objective to analyze and to reveal what is actually true. Their objective is that Islam is the truth and that they need to find a way to prove that to the public. How can you trust people like that? How could it be that I cannot trust anyone else who has something negative to say about this religion and this book, but I have to trust all those people who say good stuff about it? Not even all the people who say good stuff about it. Even there, even among the Muslim scholars and apologists, we are being selective. We choose the ones that we like and reject the ones we don't like. And most often we don't even make these choices. Most often we are simply born into a, an Islamic school that accepts and rejects certain guidelines and we go by that we are able to do that yet we are never able to discard our faith in islam because it is the absolute truth one way or another how can that be a result of healthy thinking but these doubts these questions these conclusions these free thoughts in my mind kept piling up and piling up and piling up without anyone being able to answer them and i really gave it a chance i really prayed i really tried i really did my best but eventually there was just no choice left because i tried to be reasonable i tried to give precedence to reason and the reason simply defeated the indoctrination of islam that was so strong. I eventually arrived at a long journey ahead where I started questioning the existence of God. And that was an entire different journey that I will probably come to quite soon. I wasn't entirely sure whether a God exists or not, but I was definitely sure that my God could not be the one that Muhammad introduced to his people in the 7th century in a, in a desert of ignorance that we adopted through indoctrination by our parents after they were given this religion by force through religious wars. Of course, losing faith in Islam means eternal damnation, hellfire, being equal to a beast in Islam, or worse. And it also means death by Islamic law. But it didn't really matter anymore. You couldn't have possibly scared me at that point anymore because I just simply didn't have faith anymore. It's not something that I chose. I didn't choose to be an ex-Muslim. Ex-Muslim life chose me. No, seriously, that's how it goes. See, that is why when people tell me today that I will be punished, that I will regret this, that I was never a real Muslim, that I'm a fake ex-Muslim, that I just did this for my own desires. When people tell me all these things, they just appear so meaningless. I can't take these accusations seriously because they come from people who haven't even experienced what I experienced, who didn't even go through what I went through. Most of them because they chose to be afraid instead, to be cowards instead. Just like I chose to be a coward for a long time until I finally freed myself. Until I saw the world as it really is and found that it is actually a beautiful place outside the indoctrination of this terrible religion that was forced on our ancestors, planted into the minds of our parents and given to us so that we never question it. This is how I lost faith and it is great to see that I'm not alone. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and to like and to Support me if you want to, and have a great day. Stay away from Islam.